Because Jesus said, where two or three gather, there I am with you. And right then, church is established. The gates of hell will not prevail. And when you two or three touch and agree and ask anything in my name, I will do it for them according to my will. This is according to his will. We know that when we pray this prayer, God is going to move according to his will. Micro prayer. We also need what we call macro level prayer. And what we mean by that is that you see in the Bible that there's times where there's catalytic gatherings. There's times where the people of God come together and where one can push away a hundred, two can push away a thousand. Okay? And so literally, you got, there's power in our prayers when we gather in numbers. What happens is there's a greater level of unity. And when we begin to release agreement as a united body of Christ, it begins to push back darkness exponentially in a region. Ephesians 6 says our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against what? Powers, principality, spiritual forces of darkness, you guys. Our battle is not against the physical darkness. Our battle is against the spiritual principalities that are holding our campuses, our cities, and our nations in bondage. And the only way to destroy these strongholds, the only way to take them down is through massive united prayer. When I go to Indonesia and I see millions praying together at the same time, there's a reason why Christianity in the largest Muslim nation in the world is now 30% Christian. It's because people are praying night and day, day and night. There's a reason when I go to underground China and these people pray like their life depended on it. Every day. They wake up early because their life depends on it. Africa, millions. They have prayer meetings where literally a million people gather for a four-hour prayer meeting just for once a week in Nigeria. Once a week in Nigeria. A million will gather for an all-night prayer meeting, and you wonder why crime is decreasing. You wonder why darkness is fleeing. It's because the evil principalities are being pushed back when the people of God begin to rise up in prayer. What does this look like on our university campuses? All right. Well, maybe you begin to galvanize and begin to motivate and begin to recruit Christians from all fellowships, all churches, and say, you know what? The only way UCLA, the only way that UC Riverside, the only way that Harvard University is going to get touched by God is if we unite and humble ourselves and repent and pray. This is the only way that's going to happen. And so you begin to bring people together and we begin to do what we call corporate prayer. I want to say corporate prayer. Biblically, we can see prayer walking, okay? They marched around Jericho seven times. And so very specifically, you would gather students, gather leaders, gather the church and say, you know what? What are the strongholds on our university? What are the areas of deepest darkness? Is it frat row? Is it this center of human ideology and false philosophy? Where is it on our campus? Let's go there and let's begin to declare that the kingdom of hell must not prevail. The gates of hell, what? Would not prevail against what? The church. So what happens is when you go to these strongholds, you begin to declare, in the name of Jesus, we declare that these gates of hell must come down now in Jesus' name. And begin to declare the blessing of God. Begin to prophesy the destiny of God. Begin to take down the strongholds in that area so that heavens can open and God's will can be established on the earth as it is in heaven. Prayer walking. Okay? There may be times biblically where you see corporate fasts. Okay? We're in Joel 2. It says, if there's destruction, if you see darkness on your university, if there's alcohol, suicide, whatever's going on, gather the believers to come together to repent and to pray. All right? And this is what we have solemn assemblies. This is where you see the call, uh, massive prayer fasting movements that I've been a part of for the last five years, where we've gathered hundreds of thousands of young people in different specific cities across America to pray and fast and repent for specific sins in specific cities. All right? So we go to Washington, D.C., we repent of destruction and darkness in the government. We go to Boston and we repent with 50,000 Christians in Boston repenting of human ideology and humanism. We go into Los Angeles, we gather, okay, at was it the Rose Bowl, about 30,000, and we begin to pray and say, God, we repent of pornography industry. We repent of the, Babel, the Babylon spirit and that darkness that comes out of Hollywood. And we begin to repent as a large, massive group of people to shift a demonic spirit in an entire city and region. Well, guess what? If you do that in a city or region, how much more do you need to do that on the campus? Okay. So you need to hear from God and say, God, what's happening on our university? How do we come together as an army of God and begin to destroy the works of darkness in our city, in our actual campus? This is what we call macro-level prayer. 
One of the things that we see biblically in the Old and the New Testament is what we see the tabernacle of David and 24-7 prayer. We see in 1 Chronicles 13 all the way through 16, we see in Solomon's temple, is that you see that God's heart was what? My house shall be called a house of for all nations. And I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. You guys, something that we see that precedes every missionary movement is a massive movement of prayer that undergirds before the revival breaks out. Okay? And so what does that prayer movement look like? Well, you've seen it in the tabernacle, David. King David actually had a tent called Zion on the Mount Zion, and he would build a tent, and it had no walls. He would put the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of God's presence, in the middle of this tent. He would hire thousands of full-time worshipers and singers, priests, who would recite scripture, and they would pray night and day, day and night. Night and day, day and night. How many of you guys would like to get paid full-time to worship God? Okay? And literally, during David's reign, he had more authority, more government, more army troops. He had more power, more riches. Him and Solomon combined in their reign, they had more jurisdiction and authority over the land. They literally saw heaven on earth. Why? Because there was an open heaven because of night and day 24-7 prayer. Okay? And so before we walk it out, we have to pray it out. We have to pray it out before we walk it out. When we begin to pray, the heavens open. And guess what? Evangelism becomes easy. You see, here's an example. Right now, in Boston, my friends with Camps Crusade, they've been there for literally 20-something years, okay? Trying to do evangelism and hitting walls, hitting walls, hitting walls. Some of my friends went in there two years ago and set up the J-Hop Boston House of Prayer. About 20 students praying day and night in Boston for the last 24 months. You know what happened? We got a report back and they said, we don't know what happened, but ever since you guys started coming into Boston and started praying night and day, people are getting saved left and right. We've seen more salvations in the last 24 months, okay, than we have in 20 years. Okay? This is the power of 24-7 prayer. And so right now, in 2006, God spoke to me. That he would release campus houses of prayer on every university in North America. Okay? And I told people this. That there's going to be 24-hour prayer. And when we begin to pray, it opens the door for revival and transformation to happen. Okay? But without prayer, guess what? We're going to be knocking on walls. We're going to be hitting walls. All right? And so when I prophesied this in 2005, people thought I was crazy. Well, guess what? 2006 came, and we literally had 10 universities across the nation. And we said, what if we covered a whole semester across North America with 24-7 prayer? University of Texas, Harvard, Stanford, UCLA, USC, 40 days here, UC Berkeley. We gathered 10 campuses. It went nonstop. We set up a website called campustransformation.com. All of a sudden, spontaneously, by a move of God, in just three months, we saw 70 to 80 major universities do 24-hour prayer in 2006. Okay? First time ever. You guys got to understand, the student volunteer missionary movement, okay, that happened in the 1800s and early 1900s, they didn't even have 24-hour prayer yet. They prayed, and God sent out 100,000 full-time student missionaries. Can you guys imagine that? We're living in a day right now. Where today, we tracked over 200 universities in North America that have did 24-hour prayer rooms all across America. You guys, this is exciting to me. Okay? When the people of God, a generation, begins to take prayer seriously and takes God's power and His presence seriously, I believe God is going to raise up a move of missions in our generation that will completely outweigh everything we've seen in history before. It was 100,000 in the first student missionary movement. I'm believing God sent millions, millions from North America. Because this generation is saying, God, we need you. We cry out to you. Program's not enough. A church service not enough. God, a, a, a theology is not enough. I need to know that your presence is real, and I need an encounter with God. We owe this generation an encounter with God. All right?